morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the uh, second session of the seminar number six. It's titled Looking Behind the Curtain, Critical Factors Influencing Resilience Today. This session will build on the key messages from session one and identify critical factors that lead to urban water resilience. So I know you, that you had a, a question that you wanted to ask me. Yeah, so let me let me ask you a question, right? I mean, in the previous session, we heard about a num from a number of global champions how they are contributing to building resilience in in their different roles and capacities. I mean, there are mayors, utility staff, there are representatives of local communities. Going into the second session, is there a standard definition of resilience at the city level? Yeah, thank you so much, you for. I think that's a very important question, and I think that. Uh, this is something that keeps coming up and when we when we speak about resilience, what does it mean? What does it look like? And I think that I don't think there's a standard definition. And, and as you mentioned, we heard from many different speakers yesterday that we're looking at resilience from, from their own point of view and their own scope, uh, whether it's the city, the, the utility or, or any other um, levels that, are, that should and are considering resilience. So I think that um, while there is no standard definition of resilience, we have seen that there are some common characteristics that uh, organizations and people in communities are considering when, when looking at resilience building. And I think that um, it's, it's quite important to continue exploring, you know, what does it look like and what does a resilient city look like and what does a, a resilient water utility look like? Um, so I think that that is a conversation that is going to be ongoing. And I think that is a point that is going to be brought up today. I mean, as a matter of fact, we, this, this wonderful session is, is shaped um, around looking at broadly what resilience looks like, and then we're going to go into citywide initiatives and then looking at community uh, level initiatives. So I think it's, it's something that we will continue exploring. And certainly we're, we're going to touch on that in our session three, uh, which is the, the round tables that are going to be introduced later on. Uh, but I wanted to also pose some questions for you. The first one is, I mean, as you know, building resilience takes some time, um, and this makes it a bit difficult uh, when it comes to sustaining political buy-in. Um, so, so what can you tell us uh, has been done across some cities uh, to to this purpose? Yeah, I think that's, that's that's I think one of the key questions to ask and to answer. Right? I think before I start answering the question, it's important to realize that for someone living in a city, a dry tap is a dry tap. Whether it's because of climate change or because the utility is running out of water or they're not collecting its, its tariffs, it doesn't matter. A dry tap remains a dry tap. And that also kind of is a nice stepping stone for what and how do you sustain political support. If you look at the city of Rotterdam, it's one of the global champions on, on building and urban resilience. They learned very early in the process that resilience doesn't sell politically. What, what sells is a better city to live. And, and what, what, what they've done, they actually always combined measures to build resilience with, with measures that make the city a better place to live. For instance, they have huge pair of parks on, on rooftops. They have more attractive um, borders, they have more attractive uh, riverfronts, right? They build resilience, they protect the city, but they also make the city a better place to live. And I think that's one of the key things that we have to always keep in mind. It's not resilience, it's making the place, the city a better place to live. That is a very good point. And, and I haven't had the pleasure of going to Rotterdam, but you're making it seem very, very attractive. Uh, and then the, the second question before we go to Tony and Luis is, uh, could you give us a few examples of, of challenges typical to resilience building beyond political buying? Yeah, I think I think we all know like the water sector is not an easy sector to work in. It it's a highly fragmented sector. No, that's that's very good point. And 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 as we are having the session, of course, earlier in the summer, we we also saw the flooding in in Germany and the wildfires in the United States. So it's two examples of you know we're handling the the COVID nineteen pandemic, but that doesn't mean that other shocks and stresses are not continuing to to threaten cities and and society um, in general. But um, we could talk about this for, for a very yeah. long time, but I think uh, we're going to hear the perspective of, of many different people in this wonderful discussion. So I think that um, it's time for us to start with the next um, component of our session. So uh, I would like to welcome Tony Wong from, from Water Sensitive Cities and Luis Ellis from Arup. 
and they're going to be framing the discussion for the remaining of the of the panel and they're going to be speaking on principles of building urban water resilience so um not an easy task but we want to hand it over to you louise and, and tony thank you looking forward Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to an introduction, an introduction to the principles on building urban water resilience. Uh, Tony and I are going to have a have a really interesting conversation this morning um, about this topic. Tony, do you want to start by introducing Hi. yourself? Hi. Yes. Good morning, Louis, and, and I'm Tony Wong. I'm a professor of sustainable development at uh, Monash University. Uh, yeah, and we're here to have a chat about resilience. And perhaps, uh, Louis, one of the first things that, that struck me about building urban resilience, whether it be about water or about any system, uh, it, it's very clear that this it is a social technical uh, endeavor, uh, social economic, social environmental, uh, and that it really concerns looking at resilience at, at multiple systems. Yeah, I agree entirely there, Tony. I mean, building um, water resilience it involves elements like water governance, financial resilience, infrastructure resilience, the resilience of the natural system, um, as well as the social resilience of citizens and communities. Yeah, look, and and and, and perhaps we could we could unpack that a little bit more. You know, in that uh, you know, building resilience is 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 two sides of the coin. One is about infrastructure, and the other is about social. And no matter what the challenges are, whether it is about the pandemic or climate uh, climate change or, or, or demographic or economic shock, uh, I, I believe, and I think we, we both agree, that investment needs to be directed both at the infrastructure as well as building the social capacity, the governance capacity for resilience. Uh, but in, in, in terms of infrastructure, for instance, one of the points I really would like to make uh, to you and, and the audience really is that uh, being an engineer, uh, you know, we're so used to a risk-based approach to planning infrastructure. But you know, with climate change, we, we no longer can rely on traditional statistical methods to actually plan our infrastructure. And so in recent times, we find that uh, there is a need to move to a scenario-based approach, uh, really testing different scenarios and the robustness of our system rather than actually looking at a probability approach to uh, likelihood of failure or an economic risk approach, which is a traditional approach that we have. So I'd be interested to hear your views about the, the shift towards a scenario-based approach in planning infrastructure. Yes, I agree, Tony. The past is, is no longer a predictor of the future, and the, the future has a much wider uncertainty band. Um, and in terms of long term planning, that consideration of kind of multiple scenarios um, will be required to, to develop our plans moving forward. Um, and as well as scenarios in, in terms of what, what the external factors that are going to affect us, uh, we also need to consider um, having a number of different options um, for our plans moving forward um, a series of adaptation pathways, so to speak, um, that allows us to take a much more stepwise approach to building resilience based on the speed of change of external factors, allowing us for flexibility um, as we learn over time. Yeah, and in, in my experience and my travel uh, helping uh, cities build infrastructure resilience. One of the things that's coming through very clear for me is this emergence of what I often refer to as hybrid infrastructure. You know, the, the concept of how do we make most of our existing infrastructure by some add-ons. You know? uh, for instance, a hybrid centralized, decentralized infrastructure that could be implemented uh, locally in a piecewise way. Uh, hybrid blue-green infrastructure that brings nature-based solution into traditional uh, hard infrastructure. Um, and, and, and perhaps even the notion that they are hybrid because of their management and co-investment. Hybrid in terms of different governments 
actually coming together to manage a set of infrastructure that delivers uh, multiple benefits. Uh, and, and so I'm finding that uh, hybrid infrastructure uh, does allow for much more responsive, adaptive response uh, to situations rather than locking in for 20, 30 years, the type of traditional infrastructure that we are so familiar with. Yes, and there's a lot to unpack there, Tony. I think on, on the nature-based solution side, you know, environmental resilience of the basin has this foundational role to play in the resilience of the water system. They're so intrinsically linked. Um, and there's some really great examples of this, you know, upstream, um, upstream of Cape Town with the fine boss habitat and protecting, removing alien invasive species to protect more of Cape Town's fresh water resources. And also things like natural flood management in the river hull catchment in the UK. Um, but downstream also, I think it has a role to play in protecting our waterways, but also protecting our coastlines from coastal flooding. Things like restoring the mangroves in Miami and, and blue-green infrastructure in cities like New York um, to improve the water quality of the receiving watercourses. Um, and I, I totally agree with you that this is um, these are solutions that bring wider benefits and, and often need engagement from lots of different stakeholders, um, both uh, to de develop the plans, but also in operation and maintenance of these um, more nature based solutions. Mm -hmm. And we see that often, you know, in the city water resilience approach, bringing together these multiple stakeholders to develop um, these collaborative action plans. Um, where there's ownership shared across the multiple stakeholders. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the points that you, you made about, uh, which I want to add to the concept of hybrid infrastructure is of course the relationship between the city and its catchment. And to be able to actually start to think about building resilience on a much more holistic whole of catchment uh, aspects as well. You know, the, like you say, the relationship to upstream of the city and downstream of the city. But it, I'm curious to hear from you about your thoughts on, on the other side of the coin, the social resilience. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, social resilience, I think, plays a, a really crucial role. And maybe one of the commonalities that we've seen across all 11 cities is, is the importance of social resilience and particularly um, water governance. I mean, social resilience has so many different levels. You know, you have the personal resilience of, of citizens. Um, you have community resilience, both in terms of literacy um, about kind of water challenges, but also in terms of preparation and, and response to shocks and stresses. And then at the top level, you have the kind of government and corporate corporation capacity for things like collaboration, strategic planning, financing um, to improve water resilience. Um, and most crucially, I think the collaboration between those different basin actors is, is really important um, so that you can develop these more um, basin wide plans linking the city to its surrounding basin or catchment, um, all of which are um, drawing water from this uh, from from the catchment itself. Mm, yeah, I really like the, the, the concept that you know, social resilience it's not just about the community, although community literacy uh, with uh, an awareness of what the stresses might be actually impact on their behavior. But at the same time, you know, people like you and I, the professionals actually having the, the capacity, the tools to innovate is just as much uh, about resilience. And, and of course, government creating the enabling policy and, and really investing in social resilience is investing in all of them. Uh, you know, building strong communities that understand systems, building the skills of, of the professionals in that city, and of course, government. Um, but, you know, the, the, the key, as you say here about uh, communication and transparency, it's, you know, it, it's, it's quite uh, non-conventional, don't you think? It is, and building trust, I think, is is really important for citizens in both preparing but also responding um, to shocks and stresses. And if we if we look at the case of Cape Town, you know, they did some really um, crucial work, I think, in building trust um, in the community, um, so that there was this kind of shared endeavour to use fifty litres of water per person per day, which is you know quite a challenging target. Um, things like developing a, a water outlook report, which was you know, very transparent around the situation 
education in the city and and raising awareness through things like dam level dashboards and I think you know building community and and this personal resilience is really crucial um but it's also quite challenging um and I think you know it, it really requires um ground um, grassroots level action and activity um to get kind of true ownership of um, the preparedness and the response and we see that in Hull where they've got uh, community flood warnings which kind of provide this link between um, authorities and the communities at risk from flooding and help pass on you know crucial information about flood warnings and um, information to residents who are specifically vulnerable or at risk in the community um, and provide information on on how flooding happens what's happened historically um, and how the community can kind of better prepare themselves Mm, mm. I think we're running out of time. So perhaps the key message that we would like to get across is that resilience, there are two sides to the coin, infrastructure resilience, social resilience. Uh, in infrastructure planning, I think that we have to move to a scenario-based approach and really have to, have to discount a lot of the traditional risk-based approach in infrastructure planning. And, and finally, the, 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 the emergence of hybrid infrastructure merging centralized, decentralized systems, customizing to specific contexts, embedding nature-based solutions into blue, green, gray built infrastructure, and implementing these hybrid systems as and when needed, involving a combination of co-investors, private, uh, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, would be my take on, on what infrastructure resilience is. Uh, what, what would be your take on social resilience, uh, Louis? So I think social resilience, as we've talked about, Tony, it has these three elements and it's really important that we um, focus on all three. Uh, and that's quite challenging because you're kind of sharing your focus. But the first around and building that kind of personal and community resilience, developing that trust between government and citizens um, and informing um, communities about the shocks and stresses that they face and how they can prepare for them and also what the long term plans look like. The second element about building capacity um, in the professional um, domain in the in the building that capacity in terms of innovation um, for uh, innovative resilience practices. And then this third element about building capacity um, in the governance uh, and having that adaptive capacity and collaboration between the different um, governmental and non-governmental actors um, so that they can develop and work towards a much more integrated and um, water resources and and wastewater services plans for the future uh, and work together really to create a much more um, water resilient uh, cities and communities moving forward thank you well that was fun thanks Tony. So, Carla, um, maybe it would be good that you present yourself first uh, before we start the interview. Sure. Hi, Francois, and it's and it's really an honor to, to speak to you today. Um, my name is Carla Kalanidhi Vairavamuthi, and I'm currently the CEO of the International Water Association. By training, I'm an engineer, uh, and I've worked as a water engineer, and, you know, that's, that's my background. So, I would go straight into the matter. Uh, is, according to you, is urban water resilience a utopia or reality? I think um, urban water resiliency has to be a reality, right? Particularly with the global change pressures that we're experiencing. Um, currently, it's 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 a it's a dream, right? It's more of a utopia. So, the question is, how do we transition from where we are now to this space where? Our, our systems, our communities, our infrastructure are more resilient to some of the global change pressures we're facing. But I don't think that we've given sufficient thought to some of these challenges in the past. And so I think currently most of our systems are not really very uh, resilient. And so it is, a, it is a, an ambition, a very noble ambition, but some an ambition that needs a lot of work, a lot of thinking in order to, to realize. I think there are a couple of things, right? I mean, when you think about um, a utility leader or decision maker, right, they 
They do want to move towards um, a situation where they are utilizing their resources and managing their systems in a much more sustainable way. And you see that in the water sector, in the urban water sector, in the way that they're moving towards sort of more circular economy approaches. They are thinking much more about the productive use of water. So they're matching quantity and quality to intended use and they're moving away from this idea of drinking water being used for everything. So there is this deep uh, ambition, wish to transition to this type of thinking. However, most of these decision makers are also struck by the reality that there is global change taking place. And with that global change, there are huge uncertainties, right? And it's very hard for um, these decision makers to both on the one hand want to transition to this very noble sort of idea of being much more sustainable in the way they utilize their resources. So the way we use water, the way we reuse water, et cetera. And on the other hand, how do they deal with uncertainties, right? How do they how do they make decisions in this very uncertain world? And so it becomes quite difficult for them. And so the outcome of this is that they tend to take the easy option, which is to replace old with new. And so they reinforce the old paradigm. The old paradigm is not really well suited for you know the resiliency idea. And so the question is, how do we transition out of this? And the transition for me is, first of all, creating more adaptive systems, systems that um, can incrementally grow and change over time, right? So they're not fixed. You don't have this sort of fixed infrastructure, which, you know, um, has no ability to adapt to some of the global change pressures. But you have systems that, as we start to know more about the future, we can move them in different directions. You see that, for example, with stormwater management, where a lot of the decentralized approaches, some people call them SUDs, some people call them low impact development, some people call them BMPs. But these decentralized options, they allow you to sort of add more and more complexity over time as you know more about the future moving forward. In terms of water management, if we start to, you know, move forward in some of these sort of really no regret type policies, i.e. using water more than once, rather than just using water once and throwing away, but really trying to bring that water back and utilizing it two or three times. I think if we start thinking about, you know, recovering value from the waste streams, then that also gives you this adaptive capacity, right? Because as, you know, things change, as water becomes less available, as because of climate change, for example, and demand increases because of urbanization, because you've invested in efficiency gains, it allows you to have this capacity to, to, to respond to some of these external pressures, right? Are there any cities that you know of that uh, are closer to that dream? No, not really, you know. I think that... Um, it's still a utopia, basically. <laughs> I think, you know, I think there are some countries where people are managing their current situation very well. You know, Singapore is a classic example, Chennai and Tamil Nadu, you know, they have these portfolio of water sources that gives them this, this resiliency, right? So when one water source dries up, they can depend on other potential sources. Uh, but most of these are out of necessity rather than design. Right. Um, what resiliency requires is much more sort of forward thinking and, you know, future proofing your systems moving forward rather than being reactive. Um, so there are some good examples, you know, where people are, Namibia, you know, Windhoek is another classic example. There are some good examples where uh, the water footprint has been reduced, so these sort of no regret actions have been taken. There are good examples where countries have used, you know, green infrastructure to manage stormwater, for example. Um, but I don't think it's, it's, it's been done in a very systematic way that really, you know, creates a very resilient outcome at the mm. moment. That's why you see many major cities experiencing terrible floods, terrible, you know, dry spells, which they can't cope with because they haven't really prepared for some of these eventualities yet. Okay. So just one last key message. What would you like to give to our participants, the people are listening to us? One last key message for them. I think, um, you know, with everything that's happening in the world, I think there is no question that we now have to have see a paradigm shift, right? We have to really shift lanes and move away from business as usual, move away from tinkering and trying to optimize relatively suboptimal systems 
to really trying to transition out of our, you know, highly centralized, uh, use water once, throw away type of approaches to a much more decentralized approach, um, which gives us some adaptive capacity. And also we have to rethink the way in which we use and reuse water. Um, and we have to do that pretty quickly because, you know, it looks like the problem is getting uh, worse much faster than we had all anticipated. Well, thank you very much, Carla. I really enjoyed uh, discussing with you and I wish you the very best uh, to in your continuation of your position there. Thank you, Francois. Take care. All right, thank you. México tiene una gran cantidad de ciudades de diferente tamaño, territorio, clima, cuencas de agua y hábitats naturales, en el que se encuentran desde selvas tropicales hasta desiertos, pero en el que la estacionalidad de las lluvias no es uniforme, lo que genera meses de lluvia intensa y meses de elevada sequía, con una marcada escasez económica de agua. Eso significa un gran reto para la administración del recurso hídrico. Ante esta reducción de los índices de agua renovable, se han realizado estudios para fortalecer las finanzas de la administración del agua urbana y se han desarrollado estrategias para generar ingresos y más capitales que puedan financiar acciones resilientes. Esto impulsó el desarrollo de nuevos modelos predictivos para fortalecer la administración del agua urbana, cuidando la naturaleza, modernizando las leyes con bases de digitalización, estos modelos de ingeniería de costos y de tarifas son para reforzar el financiamiento de los servicios urbanos de agua en todo tipo de cuencas y ciudades. Se desarrolló un análisis dimensional con datos de volumen, consumo, ingresos, habitantes y capacidad de pago de los ciudadanos, con lo que se han generado indicadores móviles de tipo bursátil porque el agua urbana es una ente viva, dinámica y con cierta volatilidad. Se calculan los niveles de concentración y de dispersión en el consumo en diferentes temporadas del año, en forma numérica y gráfica, lo que permite proponer acciones financieras directas, modernizar reglamentos, optimizar tarifas y canalizar recursos hacia sectores urbanos que los pueden aprovechar mejor. Se enseña simuladores interactivos de costos y de tarifas e inversiones para cada ciudad y se mide el grado de sensibilidad contra los ingresos, lo que permite favorecer la captación de recursos, premiando el ahorro, apoyando a grupos desfavorecidos y considerando el impacto de las variables económicas de este país. Los modelos son totalmente compatibles con agencias calificadoras y con la banca de desarrollo, así como con entidades reguladoras. Se han aplicado en pruebas, consultorías, cursos y manuales. Consideramos que con el mejoramiento de las finanzas del agua urbana se captan y se canalizan gradualmente más recursos para elevar la seguridad en el suministro en zonas de estrés y se incrementa la solvencia para instrumentar acciones resilientes. Los modelos permiten inducir cambios balanceados para mejorar el consumo, rehusar el agua y generar incentivos legales, ya sean temporales o permanentes, que le permitan a los ciudadanos y a los gobiernos reaccionar ante contingencias y convivir de mejor forma con el agua, desde la cuenca hasta los hogares. Los modelos digitales predictivos son una herramienta de administración de riesgos, lo que robustece la gestión de las empresas operadoras de agua y les permite tener una mayor resiliencia ante diferentes variables que afectan su operación de área. Los resultados obtenidos son totalmente replicables y nos han per permitido estructurar una base de conocimientos y de datos que se pueden aprovechar en ciudades o situaciones similares para elevar la resiliencia humana e institucional y buscar soluciones ambientalmente sustentables 
económicamente viables y socialmente aceptables. Hi, I'm Shreya and I lead the Green Cities Initiative at the Center for Social and Environmental Innovation. The initiative is centered on building water and climate resilience in the urban Indian context. We are currently focused on India's third largest city, Bengaluru. With rapid urbanization, Bengaluru has lost almost 80% of its water bodies. Historically, the city's tanks and lakes served both as natural flood buffers and fresh sources of water for all of the residents. Now, utilities are struggling to keep pace with the ever-growing demand. Almost 40% of the city's residents do not have access to fresh pipe water networks and are completely reliant on groundwater. This has made our groundwater aquifers deplete. On the other hand, our sewage networks face a similar fate, with almost 50% of households lacking access to pipe sewer lines. And for this reason, a lot of septage and untreated wastewater effluent enter our water bodies and waterways, leaving them both polluted and also perennially full, making them unable to buffer the city from floods. In order to solve the water problems that the city is facing, we thought that it's first important to establish the city's current water balance. To do this, we created a Python model that emulates the cascading lake system in the city. This was then coupled with data from the utilities to understand how much water is coming in and how much water is leaving the city. Once the water is used, only half of it is treated. And of the water that is treated, almost all of it is sent to peri-urban districts like Kolar, where it's used for both agriculture and industry. We envision an alternate scenario in the city, one which is far more circular. Almost 40% of the domestic water needs can be met through non-portable sources. So using wastewater as a viable alternative to fresh water could be a great start. The city is already moving towards increased circularity. In 2016, the Bengaluru Water Supply and Sewerage Board introduced a mandate requiring all residents living in apartments with more than 50 units to install decentralized sewage treatment plants. These sewage treatment plants now collectively treat almost 30% of the sewage in the city. But despite doing so, a lot of this water goes unused and much of it is let out into stormwater drains, which then end up in our water bodies. We try to uncover the reasons for this by conducting a series of interviews with residents, builders, and also STP operators. We realize that this is happening because of three key reasons. Number one, there's a negative cultural perception of wastewater. Number two, the water that is being treated is of poor quality because of inefficient treatment systems and poor monitoring. And number three, and perhaps the most important reason of all, is that there's a lack of a market for wastewater beyond the apartment fence. So we're proposing two solutions that help to actually boost the amount of water that's reused within these gated communities. Our first solution is called the Great to Green campaign. In this campaign, we're aiming to take excess wastewater from these apartments and use it for greening. Since it's high in organic content and low in chemical affluence, this water is perfect. A lot of our partner NGOs have seen success in this space already. And the second campaign that we're launching is the Grey to Blue campaign. In this campaign, we try to overcome the cultural perception that people have of wastewater by sending it through additional filtration in nature-based solutions so that it can be used to recharge groundwater aquifers. This is our Grey to Blue concept. In doing so, we can boost water resilience by giving the city a backstop during droughts. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kerry Burge, the project manager for the build component of the RISE program in Indonesia. The RISE program is designing and delivering, together with communities, water sensitive interventions in informal settlements in Indonesia and Fiji. Our demonstration project in the neighbourhood of Batua in Makassar, Indonesia is now commissioned and operational, and we've successfully completed the co-design and detailed engineering designs for our next six sites. As a first step in codifying the experiences so far, we've developed a framework that outlines the key elements of a water-sensitive approach. 
The framework contains 10 components that will vary according to country, city and settlement conditions. It also contains five principles that remain valid across contexts in order to shape any water sensitive intervention. I will elaborate briefly on two of the principles that are particularly relevant to operationalizing the principles of resilience. The first is co-design or community design and the principle that any water sensitive intervention should be people centered and people powered. The water sensitive cities approach must be underpinned by a non-negotiable commitment to value people's participation in all aspects of the project. Working together to locate infrastructure, not just for water and sanitation, but for placemaking and the design of future community spaces generates a shared sense of responsibility for the success of the project. This is critical for long-term success of the infrastructure. And this in turn is critical for safeguarding the resilience that the infrastructure provides. The second principle is that of working with nature. The water sensitive approach combines green infrastructure or nature based solutions, such as constructed wetlands for wastewater treatment, with simple but robust pumps and smart control systems to allow, allow enhanced management of the system and real time troubleshooting. It is the combination of green and grey infrastructure together with smart technology that can dramatically increase the flexibility of these designs and allow infrastructure to reach the poorest and most vulnerable communities. Combining grey and green infrastructure and smart technologies can increase neighbourhood resilience through improved sanitation, drainage and the opportunity to use wastewater as a resource for economic activities. Other decentralised infrastructure, such as rainwater tanks, can complement the approach by increasing the diversity of water supply sources to improve household resilience. This study is the first step in codifying the experiences from the RISE intervention. The water sensitive approach is not the panacea to solve the problem. However, we have seen that implementing various parts of the water sensitive approach and tailoring it with communities and local partners has delivered new, more holistic approaches to revitalization. This is critically important now, given the impact of COVID-19 on informal settlement residents and the call for more integrated responses to the challenges of urban poverty, exclusion and climate change. For more information on translating the theory of water sensitive revitalization into practice, you can download our three part knowledge product series developed in partnership with the Asian Development Bank and available for free on the RISE website. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bindu Yena. I am a program manager working with Shahidi Wamaji, which is an NGO based in Tanzania. I'm going to present to you the results of a study on amplifying citizens' voice for water security in African cities. The objective of uh, the study was to verify the impact, but also lessons of the work that we did in the past using social accountability monitoring, which aim to improve uh, water security through uh, urban water resilience. So the approach used during the study included, uh, so this intervention uh, generally involves uh, empowering communities who are affected especially those living in the urban as uh, unplanned settlement faced with the uh, water security challenges to be able to demand for improved services from the duty bearers and uh, make them accountable to act on these issues. So they would do this either by using uh, letters which were sent to these duty bearers to, to claim for their 
for improved services, or they would meet with them face to face to discuss on these issues. So based on the responses and actions that um, these duty bearers would, uh, would, would, would act, we, would, we were able to generate evidence that was uh, used uh, for our advocacy work on uh, the demanding for on the demand for for change or improvement on these issues, and this was at a higher level, where it involved uh, sector dialogue uh, interviews or meetings or formal review processes which were also organized by the Ministry of Water. But we did this with support by other CSOs and international NGOs. So the results of uh, this study, first of all, it confirmed that uh, social accountability monitoring approaches are very effective in enhancing accountability of the duty bearers themselves, but also the communities in terms of uh, improving water security and so urban water resilience. So it was through uh, communities that are empowered, engage, engaging with our duty bearers through letters and meet, meetings that impact we are able to be realized in these uh, in these uh, communities, and that this uh, at this phase, I mean during this phase, a total of ninety eight uh, change agents or communities were involved, forty eight of them being female. But also throughout uh, the study, it was confirmed that uh, face to face meetings are very powerful in uh, emphasizing the need for them to act. And this was especially um, commented by the duty bearers themselves during the interviews, where they stated that uh, uh, engagement of women during these meetings was very key because uh, knowing that women are the ones that are mostly affected when it comes to water and security issues. So the experiences that were shared by these women uh, emphasized the need for, for these duty bearers to act fast. Well, thank you very much for listening. Look, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to highlight the critical role played by households in driving urban water resilience and how this can be both a positive attribute, but also presents challenges. In doing so, I'll draw on research being undertaken by myself and colleagues across sub-Saharan Africa, with particular reference to Lagos in Nigeria and Cape Town in South Africa. During the 2018 drought in Cape Town, we saw an example of the incredible role that households can play in promoting water resilience. Water saving actions by households, backed by tough penalties, helped significantly reduce the city's daily water usage. Equally, many thousands of households sought to augment their limited public water supplies by accessing other water sources, such as through commissioning their own boreholes or well points. We see a similar strategy of self supply in towns and cities that experience pervasive water stress. Places such as Lagos, where public water supplies are unavailable, unreliable, or often untrusted. And in these situations, and when the hydrogeology, property rights, incomes and institutions allow, households secure their own access to water, often through the commissioning of boreholes or adopting water harvesting techniques. Now, this, to my mind, the distributed self-supply systems that emerge from these practices provide resilience to water shocks and also promote collective economic and social benefits. In practice, though, it introduces a new actor, the household who is instrumental in the construction of and the governance of urban water resilience. The significance of the factor requires us to consider what motivates the actions of households and how this might affect urban water resilience. 
Naturally, individual motivations vary, but some common themes emerge from our research. There is a prevalence of what might be called protective motivations, where households highlight the importance of securing access to water supplies that are reliable, convenient, and trusted. And in many cases, this is accompanied by a sense of taking control of one's own well-being and that of one's family. Some report altruistic motivations, often couched in terms of relieving pressure on scarce public water supplies or to aid family and neighbours. Notably, though, the potential environmental costs of self-supply are rarely considered as being significant. These motivations matter, I think, because not only do household actions affect the day-to-day -day water resilience of towns and cities across Africa, promoting their ability to withstand shocks, they also have a longer-term transformational effect. They're contributing to the evolution of parallel water supply structures. Now, whilst these self-supply structures can promote resilience capabilities, they also raise new challenges for the governance of water resilience, particularly if the darker side of this transformation, to borrow a phrase from Jessica Bly, is to be avoided. That darker side includes inequalities in access to water, over-exploitation or contamination of water, common water resources, and ultimately, the potential for individual resilience strategies to undermine the collective resilience of places and the communities who live there. Now, picking up on the original title of this event, I'm not saying that we have a binary choice between utopian and dystopian views of the future. Well, what I hope is that we recognize that moving from utopian dreams to the complex reality of urban water resilience requires an appreciation of the active role played by all actors in shaping that process and that households play a critical role in this. Thank you. All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. And um, we have the honor now to be closing the second session of this uh, seminar on urban water resilience. And uh, to, I'm honored to have uh, with me three of the um, speakers that you have already uh, heard. And uh, Tony Wong, so welcome again. Uh, Louise Elise, uh, welcome also again. And Joop Verhagen, thanks a lot for all three of you. We're going to be trying to make sort of a conclusion or a vision of what we have learned so far and how we can move on the urban water resilience story. So, Tony, um, Louise and Yup, what would you say that were the key points that we have learned from uh, all these speakers that we have heard in session one and session two so far? Tony, you would like to start? Sure. Look, I... I... I found uh, both session one and session two uh, very interesting in terms of how some of the broad principles that Louise and I really talked about, how they are being operationalized in, in the local context. So we, we heard a lot of examples of uh, technical resilience infrastructure to, to build uh, a more diverse water supply infrastructure for flood protection. But we also heard a lot about some of the social resilience, the importance of building trust, uh, building institutions, strong financial systems. Uh, so I, I think that I'm delighted to hear uh, all the different perspectives. Uh, and, and really the answer is that uh, there are pieces of a, of a jigsaw from what I can gather that uh, need to come together that is context specific. You know, you have different places different experience, different context. But my sense is that all of them suggest that you need both. You need to have strong institutions, strong community, but you also need to have strong science and strong technology. So I, I think that the, the, the two sessions are quite... Thank you, Tony. So really something that we heard that uh, uh, resilience is not an end to itself, but it's a process, right? That's, uh, yes, so, yes, right. So, yes, and uh, according to you, uh, uh, what did we learn from these two sessions uh, that are, is really worthwhile uh, picking up upon? Thanks, Francois. I think the first thing I want to do is echo Tony's thoughts that they're just a, a really fantastic um, 
group of speakers uh, and examples that were given across the two sessions. Um, it was really great to see um, some of the resilience thinking being put into practice. Uh, and I think it's really important to share those lessons so that others around the world can pick them up and, and operationalize themselves in their own contexts. Um, I think for me, some of the really key themes that came out were the idea that um, we shouldn't do this in isolation and that we need to work together across um, city and water actors and stakeholders uh, to develop an integrated approach um, to building water resilience. I think other elements were, um, we heard from Christina, the importance of really understanding um, the shocks and stresses that cities face. Um, and I think, you know, that's really important, whether it be too much, uh, too little uh, water or kind of poor water quality. Uh, similarly, I think really interesting to hear about the need for uh, across um, both Sao Paulo and Cape Town, this need for um, increased flexibility and redundancy, both in terms of water sources, but also in terms of water systems. Uh, and to pick up Tony's point, uh, we really don't need to forget that the people in the environment in this um, conversation, and we heard some great examples about the need for protecting um, existing water sources and upstream catchment management um, from Freetown. And I think from Sheila in, in India, the importance of um, involving the community um, in solutions, um, all of which I think are you know really crucial um, facets of resilience. Yes, thank you very much, Louise, for that uh, reflection. Um, you, um, what what did you get from this uh, discussion we had with all this? How many? Seven, eight, of, um, almost fifteen speakers we had. Yeah, I think. Let me start with echoing uh, both Tony and Louise, but yeah, sharing my appreciation for the excellent presentations of, from everybody. I mean, what it brought out is a very rich learning from things that have happened on the ground. And I think that that's what really matters, right? What happens on the ground, what utilities are doing, what municipal councils are doing, mayors, in driving resilience. Um, but I think what, what we need to acknowledge that we have a huge challenge ahead of us. Like Africa is going to triple its urban population up to 20. 2050 and a large part of this population will be living in informal settlements up to 60 percent and i think for us what what i really take away is that and what katrina also echoed is the twin challenge like service delivery in cities is not where it should be i mean like uh, there's still 800 million people without proper sanitation services for instance at the same time climate change is going to compound that uh, that challenge like and what i think is really important for us is that we start building resilient cities for the world of tomorrow which in some places might be very different from the world that we're living in right now and i think that that's our key challenge and time is short as we've heard in the recent ipcc report all right, thank you very much, Joop. Um, I would like to pose a challenge to all three of you uh, uh, in, in taking the example of Jakarta here in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia um, and uh, its capital, Jakarta, have just come up with the um, residence strategy for the city. And the residence strategy, if you look at it, it includes not only climate change or water, it includes health, it includes transport. So there's a sort of resilience for a city is something which is maybe multi-sectoral. What do you think of that, uh, Tony? <laughs> oh, it, and of course it is. You know, I, I, I think that there, there is an emerging uh, practice uh, that, that we're involved in, which is sort of planetary health. You know, the relationship between the health of the environment and the health of the people. And, and we are connected by uh, the, the, the environment we live in. And the environment we live in are impacted by many things, uh, social economic factors, climate factors. But in the end of the day, resilience, especially in the city, is also is about these people. Uh, and, uh, and, and while I've got this platform, I also want to uh, really reflect on something that really touched me in, in some of the conversation. And that was about citizens' empowerment. Uh, and how that is so important in influencing change. And uh, uh, both um, uh, Sheila and, uh, and also a presentation from Preda uh, talk about the importance of empowering community, especially the poor and the vulnerable. The best way to do that, in my mind, is water literacy. 
that they must argue their case not from an emotional standpoint, but from knowledge. All right. Thank you very much for that, uh, Tony. Louis, um, any thoughts about this multi-sectoral dimension of uh, resilience? Yes, Francois, I, I absolutely agree with the with the fact that um, resilience um, is multi-sectoral, um, and you know water underpins many of those sectors. You know it's crucial, as Tony mentioned, um, for health and well-being of communities and citizens. Um, it's crucial for culture in many parts of the world. Um, it's crucial for economic growth and stability. Um, so it really is something that underpins um, all of those elements. And I think building on that, you know, the environment is something that we're so reliant on for our water. And, and I think that really underscores the importance of environmental um, resilience um, and the need to protect our catchments. Yes, great. thanks a lot for bringing this watershed dimension as well. You, what, what would you say on this uh, multi-sectoral dimension of uh, resilience? Um, I think if I paraphrase the, the mayor of Freetown who said like water is life, it's it's a fair summary of the need to have an integrated approach. Mm -hmm. And it's not just kind of across sectors, of course, it's also as we said, like it's it's geographic as well. What I feel is really important, and it, I think it's really encouraging to hear that Jakarta is developing a resilience plan, is to have long term plans with assured budgets and all right, thanks you. So we are coming to an end to our discussion and I would like to uh, ask you the effort, it's not an easy one, <laughs> to try to condense what you would like to convey in one or maybe maximum two messages to our uh, participants here uh, around the globe. So uh, maybe as you wish, uh, Tony, are you ready to formulate one or two messages there? Sure, sure, I, I, I am. Um, uh, yeah, look, uh, I, I think that one of the key mess take home message that I got from from listening to the many speakers, of course, is uh, as you put it, uh, Francois, I, I wanted to reinforce it, that that resilience is a journey. Uh, it's a journey where we need to learn from others and then to learn to leapfrog the, the solutions such that we will not repeat those errors, whether it be in the way we invest in infrastructure or in the way we operate our infrastructure or in the way that we communicate and collaborate or not with our citizens. Louise, what would be your one or two takeaway messages there? If you would permit me to, Francois, that would be great. Um, I think the first one is that uh, integrated governance and the management of water is really crucial. Um, you know, we often kind of term water in different types. You know, we talk about drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, but it's it's all water and it's a really, really precious resource. And taking that one water approach is really crucial. And to do that, you know, we need to work together and we need to understand the roles and responsibilities in the context that we're working. Um, we need to uh, have coordination between the different actors in watersheds and basins and appropriate kind of participatory planning and financing. I think the second message I'm going to borrow from Sheila, I think it really hit me. You know, utopia is, is for dreamers and we've really got to get down to business. And I think it's a good call for action for all of us that um, we really need to, we have a huge challenge ahead of us um, and we really need to get down to action. Thanks, yes, I remember that Sheila had mentioned that uh, very strongly. Yes, thank you, Louise. You put would be your one or two takeaway messages from... Uh, so I think... One is that we are and we should be really in a hurry because we live in a rapidly urbanizing world where cities are often the engines of the economy. Um, and we live in a world that's changing rapidly, right? Um, we need to be in a hurry, but we also need to re realize that words like resilience, non-revenue water are words that don't appeal to many people. Um, the way that we communicate to the outside world needs to change. We need to package, we need to make sure that people feel that building urban resilience means building a city that's a better place to live for everybody. Um, the second, what I think is really important is to realize that cities are not just public spaces, they're also private spaces and they're also informal spaces. 
Um, a lot of people, and that's what Sheila mentioned as well, a lot of people have to rely on informal services and we need to recognize that. We need to have a narrative that appeals to private sector. Thanks a lot, uh, you, Louise and Tony. Uh, we're going to close this um, uh, two sessions by maybe uh, a small conclusion from my part as well. We've been asking the question, is urban water resilience a utopia reality? I believe that there is no such question. The question is not relevant. The, um, we must be, uh, urban water, sorry, urban water resilience must be a reality. And so that, if you agree with this, I will conclude on this one. Thank you very much, um, uh, Louise and Tony and you. And um, we 